hit record here. Um, it kind of depends if you're going into the STEM field or not. If you're going into a STEM field, what I, what I would highly recommend you take away from this class is some of the problem solving that we're going to do and ability to go, to go um, understand when it's appropriate to make assumptions or go look up something and be able to solve your, um, the questions that you're asked without getting ex ex outside help necessarily, um, being kind of self-sufficient when it comes to doing problem solving, because that's going to be really, really helpful if you go into a STEM field. Um, if you're not going into a STEM field, though, although that's still really useful to be able to do some some numerical problem solving, um, probably understanding of how the scientific method works. This is the last science class you ever take. I want you to come away with it with an understanding of that scientific theory is not the same as a the theory in everyday life. And that the scientific method is designed to continually correct itself. So it's not a flaw that scientists change what they're recommending. That's part of the process. That's the way it's supposed to work. Um, and so understanding that is a really big deal in modern political discourse to understand um, how that all works and you know, understand how um, scientists niche in modern society works. Um, so anyway, those are my go-to or my the two relevant questions. Um, and so let's, and now at this point, I'll open it up to uh, questions about the homework. You haven't had a chance to ask questions on the quiz yet this week, but if you have any questions about the homework, yeah. The third question, the black hole problem, that's kind of a tricky one, right? Um, yeah, we'll talk about that one. And then I'll also post the key. Um, to this homework this afternoon. So you have this weekend to check your answers on and everything. Um, yeah, let's let's talk about the third one. It's okay. And I'm sorry, remind me your name? Kai. All right. I'm just trying to get everybody's names down. So um, all right. So this, this one's kind of tricky because there's a lot going on in it, right? There's a lot of conversions embedded in the in information in the word problem itself. It requires you understand a little bit of the geometry involved. Um, so th but this is about as tricky as the word problems are going to get in this class. We'll throw in new concepts, but the word problems themselves won't get really too much harder than this from my point of view. Um, you might feel differently depending on your math background and, and you know, when we hit certain questions. But all right, so the goal here is to get the density of the black hole, right? So what's the definition of density? Mass over volume, right? So we can find the easiest way to find density of an entire object generally is to just find the mass of the whole object and divide it by the volume of the whole object. So with that, this is what we're going to keep coming back to when we're when we are not sure where to go with our calculations, what we're doing next. Remind ourselves everything is supposed to be trying to find one of these two numbers. Right. So the first one of these. We can we can start with either of them, but just looking at the. Um, at the paper here, suppose one of these black holes has a mass of 1.0 times 10 to the three suns. And then it says a radius equal to one half the radius of our moon. Those are the two key pieces of information. The one says the mass of, of one times 10 to the three suns, that's, we're gonna have to do some conversions, but that's how we're gonna get this number. And a radius, one half the radius of our moon, well, we're gonna have to do a little bit of um, geometry to get there, but if we know the radius and we know that it's a, we can assume it's a sphere. Um, I guess it doesn't say that explicitly, but most astronomical things are spheres since we exist in three dimensional space. Um, so that knowing the radius of the black hole is going to be what gives us our volume of the black hole. Right. So we have. 
and then it goes on to say what's the radius of our sun in it gives us the radius of sun in kilometers so radius sun 7.0 times 10 to the kilometers Well, we know that the mass of the black hole is in terms of the sun, mass of the sun, right? So we're going to use this is, even though it's a radius, this is going to be a term that helps us get to the mass of the black hole. And then we also have in the density of the sun in kilograms per meter cubed. So you can see already why it's really advantageous to use these subscripts to keep track of things, right? We don't want to mix up radius of the black hole radius of the moon, radius of the sun. We're doing a whole bunch of different radii. Keep track of them by using those subscripts. Uh, 1.4 times 10 to the third. Kilograms per cubic meter. So, how can we use, if we're gonna, let's ignore volume of the black hole for now. This and some conversions is all we need to get to the mass of the black hole. How do we get to the mass of the black hole from here? Yeah, so if we're, if we're writing it out as, as a, um, you know, roadmap, we can take radius of the sun to get to the volume of the sun, right? And once we know the volume of the sun, we can use the density of the sun to get to the mass of the sun, which then takes us to the mass of the black hole. And so obviously there's a lot more math to go in to figure out each of these steps, but this is the logic. Radius of the sun to the volume of the sun, that's just look up the equation for volume of the sphere, right? Again, we're going to assume the sun is spherical. It's pretty accurate. Once we know the trickiest thing in here that we haven't really seen before is this idea of using the density of, of, of uh, an object and the volume to get to the mass. And there's a couple ways we can show our work for doing that. Um, typically, I like to use I think density works really well when you use it as a um, as a conversion factor, right? Because if we have density of the sun in kilograms per meter cubed, per means for every, right? In other words, this is a conversion factor. We can say one, if we're talking about the sun, we can say one meter cubed is equal to 1.4 times 10 to the three kilograms. That is a conversion factor. So once we can, if we can get the volume of the sun in cubic meters, we can multiply by the density and cubic meters will cancel out cubic meters. We'll be left in kilograms, right? And once we get to the mass of the sun in kilograms, you can double check your, your problem. It says mass of 1.0 times 10 to the three sun. So we're just gonna multiply by a thousand once we get the mass of the sun to get mass of the black hole. All right, so like I said, I'm gonna put the key up later today, so I'm not gonna work through all of the numbers right now, but that's the general gist for getting the mass of the black hole. Um, I believe if you do this problem right, I'm trying to remember, it's been six months since I thought about this problem. I think it's seven times 10 to the 11 grams per cubic centimeter. Somewhere, it's something times 10 to the 11. Um, I'm fairly certain. for your final answer for the density of the black hole. Which is also kind of wild to think about. You know, water is fairly dense and it's one gram per cubic centimeter. Gold is really dense and it's 19 grams per cubic centimeter. Think about what a cubic centimeter is. It's one centimeter cube. This black hole material weighs seven times 10 to the 11. So that's 700 billion grams per cubic centimeter, which is a little bit weird. There's a reason we refer to numbers like this as astronomical, because astronomy deals with some really, really big numbers sometimes. All 
All right, so to get the volume of the black hole, it's gonna be kind of a similar process. We're gonna start from the radius of the moon, get the radius of the black hole from that, because it tells us half of the radius of the moon is the radius of the black hole. Then you can get the volume of the black hole. You just have to be careful with your units, right? If we wanna end in grams per cubic centimeter, then make sure when we get to our final number for mass of black hole, it's in grams. We get to our final number for volume of the black hole, it's in cubic centimeters. And then you just literally take your grams divided by your cubic centimeters, and you should get something times 10 to the 11. All right, questions about that process. Somebody is uh, seven times 10 to the 11. Is that sounding familiar to anybody who's finished working through it? Okay, so if you get seven times 10 to the 11, that means you did it, you did it right. If you get seven times 10 to something that's not 11, odds are you forgot a conversion somewhere. You forgot to convert grams to kilograms or something like that. It's what I call slipping a decimal place. You got the right coefficient, but not the right power. It means that you probably missed a metric conversion somewhere. Right, that's the number one place that you'll see these mistakes. Or you did something like divided by 100 when you were supposed to divide by 1,000 because you only hit two zeros on accident. Um, easy to do, which is why we check our answers, right? Questions on this process for number three. Okay, number one was probably pretty easy once you once you finish the lab, right? It's the same problem, except it gives you the thickness and asks you to find the length instead of the other way around, right? The big trick there is just the idea that a sheet of aluminum foil is not two-dimensional, right? A sheet of aluminum foil is a really, really short rectangular prism because it's not truly flat, right? It has a thickness to it. So if you know the thickness and you know the width and you know the total volume, you can find length. And then number two was just a, was one long conversion, right? Try to find all those conversions that are buried into the problem. Like a person takes about 20 breaths per minute. That's a conversion. One minute equals 20 breaths. Right, so two is just one long, you can set it up as one long conversion or you can do it as several conversions, however it makes sense to you. Um, but you should get something in the middle, something in the um, between, I believe the answer is around 80 milligrams for number two. Um, but I don't quote me on that one because that one I don't remember the final answer as well as the black hole problem. All right. So you've got the homeworks due on Sunday night. You do have a short quiz. Um, the quiz is three conversions. That's all. It's one is a mileage conversion where I say my car gets this this much mileage and has a gas tank this big. How many kilometers can I go on one tank of gas? Um, there's a density one. If I give you a mass, can you get me the volume? And then there's a temperature conversion. So practice using, in fact, let's do that. Let's do a practice problem with temperature real quick so we can see how the, um, the sig figs get weird. Is it Christopher? Yeah. What's your question? Um, so I, I have a mixture. I'm trying out these new quizzes. Two of them are numerical answers where you just have to put it in with the right number of sig figs and it won't let you put a unit in, um, but that's okay. And then the other one, the density problem is a um, show, take a picture of your work and upload your picture so I can check your work on that. So you don't need to show your work on the numerical ones. Um, that said, since there is a file upload question, you can always take a picture, one picture of your entire sheet of paper that has your work for all three of them and upload that. And anytime we do a problem just in or uh, on the quiz, that's a file upload or there's more than one file upload question, one file is fine for all three of them. 
just make sure that it's all legible when you upload that picture. Um, and you only have to upload one file. You don't, I don't need a separate file for every question. I always forget to mention that. And then I notice everybody has to go to extra work to do that. Ah, like, oh, you didn't need to do that. I just forgot to tell you. Um, so yeah, you'll have the ability to show your work as well. Uh, and we'll see how the, how it grades based on SIG case this time. I think it looks like they fixed some issues that they had with that. All right, let's do that. Um, Temperature, let's see, what's a good, let's do, let's do the boiling point of water in Celsius at altitude. Our boiling point up here is usually around 94 point, we'll call it 94.5 degrees Celsius is a boiling point of water at our altitude. Um, by the end of the class, we'll get into why our, Boiling point is different than sea level. Um, but for now, just take me at my word. The boiling point depends on atmospheric pressure. So since we have less pressure, our boiling point's different. What is that in Fahrenheit? So here's our equation. Um, sometimes you see this written. Nine, so that's exactly nine over five. So it means for every five degrees change in Celsius, that's a nine degree change in Fahrenheit. Um, a lot of times you see that simplified. If this, if those are both exact numbers, then we, when we do that division, though, we can get an exact number out of it. It's a decimal, but it's still an exact number. What is nine fifths is, as a decimal? Close, 1.5. Right. So I believe that this is the way it's written on the on the equation sheet, 1.8 Celsius plus 32, and both of these are exact numbers. It can be helpful to have it as a as a uh, fraction because then it allows you to think about it in terms of a slope, right? Five degrees Celsius is nine degrees difference in Fahrenheit. Um, but this this way fits better on a on one line of typed paper. So, so what are we going to do in terms of sig figs here? So we'll plug or sorry, if we're trying to get to Fahrenheit, we're just going to plug this in for TC, right? So Fahrenheit equals one point eight times ninety four point five plus 32, 302, 202. Oh, sorry, that's, you added the 32. Do it before, what's before the 32? 170.1, 1. exactly 170.1. Okay, so we won't always get it working out this neatly. Um, how many sig figs do we get to keep though? We just did a multiplication of an exact number times something with three sig figs, right? So how many sig figs do we get to keep? Just three. So we actually get 170 leave the decimal point on there to remind us that it's plus or minus one. And now we're going to add 32 to that, right? So 170 plus 32, that gives us our, our 202, right? And if we just plugged it all into our calculator together, we got 202.1. So this is where it gets tricky, right? We had, because we switched from multiplication and then went to um, addition, we had to round to the nearest, to the three sig figs here before we add. If you wait to the end to add the, to do the sig figs, then how do you know where to round? It's a lot trickier to work it backwards and figure out where your, your rounding steps were. 
And what's our rule if it's 170 plus or minus one degree plus 32, exactly, what's the uncertainty on our final answer? Plus or minus one degree, right? So I didn't pick the best example because we did wind up just keeping three sig figs like you might have guessed at the beginning. If I pick really carefully though, we can wind up gaining a sig fig over the course of this conversion or losing a sig fig over the course of this conversion if you don't round properly. I'm trying to avoid the one that I used on the, on the quiz so that um, you still actually have to do the work yourself. But trust me and remember, do your rounding whenever you switch operations. All right. Questions on temperature. We're gonna do some more. Temperature is not a particularly interesting. It's, it's interesting mainly because it has that weird plus 32 as a conversion. We don't see conversions like that often. Logan? There is, it's kind of a fun one. So I'm glad you asked. Um, so it turns out bo liquids boil when their vapor pressure is equal to the atmospheric pressure. Vapor pressure is basically how much it evaporates just naturally at a certain temperature. So like um, if you've ever had a water bottle in your car, you notice that there's condensation on the inside of the water bottle, right? Despite the fact, if it's sealed, I mean, um, despite the fact that it never got up to boiling necessarily, there was still water evaporating. And that, that water that's evaporating is called vapor pressure. Um, and when the vapor pressure gets to the point where it equals atmospheric pressure, that liquid boils. So since we have less atmospheric pressure here, it takes less vapor pressure to get to our atmospheric pressure. And the equation for that is vapor pressure is equal to E to the negative delta H of vaporization over RT, um, where delta H of vaporization is the energy that you have to put in per mole to get something to evaporate. So that's going to be a number in terms of joules. This is the R from the ideal gas constant. You guys talk about gases in your first chemistry class. Remember R? PV equals NRT. Okay, we'll get to that one eventually. Turns out R is actually a fundamental aspect of how the universe works, how statistics of physical objects works. Um, and then temperature in Kelvin. So basically, as your temp as your um, vapor pressure drops, the temperature that you need to get to um, to get that liquid to boil will also drop, but not in this, not in a convenient way. If we rearrange this, um, this equation, if we do some, some creative algebra, we can get natural log of the vapor pressure is equal to negative delta H over R times one over T plus a constant. Um, if we write it out like that, we can kind of look at this like it's a Y equals MX plus B equation. It's a weird one, but if we take natural log of vapor pressure and put that on our Y axis for a graph, and if we put one over temperature as the X axis for our graph, we get a straight line out of this. And the slope of that straight line is this negative delta H over R term because R is a constant and delta H is a constant depending on what the liquid is. Um, all this to say is that if we, if we plug in one for this, that would give us our, our and then solve for T, that would give us our boiling point at, at, at uh, sea level because that's assuming that our vapor pressure has to be one atmosphere. We're actually at about 0.8 atmospheres up here. So if we plug in 0.8 here, and solve for T, we could actually find out what the boiling point is that way, um, mathematically. And when you look up all these numbers and have all the data, it winds up being right around 93 and a half to 94 and a half, depending on what the pressure's doing on any given day. We will get there. This will be one of the last topics we get to. We'll actually 
take, I'll give you a bunch of vapor pressure and temperature data and you'll plot it in Excel or in a spreadsheet program, find the slope and then use that to predict a boiling point, um, which is kind of cool. It allows us to also do things like if we go into more extremes, we went to say the top of Mount Everest. Does anybody know what the atmospheric pressure is at the top of Mount Everest? It's a lot less than it is here. I want to say it's like 40% of an atmosphere, 0.4. Water is going to boil a whole lot less there. Um, I don't think anybody's ever stopped to cook ramen at the top of Mount Everest, but if you did, you'd find that it would take a lot longer to cook the noodles because the water does not boil as at as high of a temperature, which is why all of our cooking is different up here. If, it, if you've ever noticed that, um, you actually have to go a little bit longer than what the Kraft Macaroni Cheese Box says um, to get the noodles all the way cooked. It's because the instructions are made for at sea level. Turns out when 95% of the world's population lives within 100 meters of sea level, all the instructions are for sea level. Now, none of that matters though for now, but... It's a good question to ask. All right, let's do some practice. We, we did some practice on Monday with higher powers. Was there any other questions before I moved on from that? You're welcome to continue my, my tangent, my digression. If you have good relevant questions. We're making good time so far, so. All right, does everybody remember doing these higher power equations? If we were gonna find the volume of a box, if we're given the units in terms of centimeters, what's the volume in cubic centimeters of the box? That's pretty easy, right? If it's if you're given the measurements length, width, and height in terms of cubic centimeters, finding volume cubic centimeters is is easy. Right? Volume length times width times height. So it doesn't matter what order it's in, right? Seven point six eight centimeters times twelve point four five centimeters times 5.56 centimeters. Five thirty one point six centimeters cubed. Centimeters cubed because, because we got centimeters times centimeters times centimeters, right? Everybody with me on that one? How many sig figs do we get to keep? Three. So 532. What is that in liters? Does anybody know the conversion between cubic centimeters and liters? Close. Cubic centimeters to milliliters is one. Um, and that's actually, that's an exact number. A, a liter is defined as being one thousandth of a cubic meter. And if you work all the math backwards, you wind up with a thousandth of a liter is equal to one cubic centimeter exactly. So since that's a one-to-one -one conversion, um, we don't even really need to show our conversion for that, but you can. If we wanted to put this in milliliters, we could write it out and say, well, one cubic centimeter equals one milliliter. Well, that's even easier than multiplying by 10, right? Literally all that's changing in this case is we went from cubic centimeters to milliliters. We're just calling the same thing by a different name really though, right? So a lot of times we won't even show this conversion um, because it's really not all that necessary. Once you know that they're the same, we can just switch back and forth kind of at will. Does anybody know the other abbreviation for cubic centimeters? It's one that you may have heard on a medical show, anything set in the hospital. CCs, CCs literally stands for cubic centimeters. I don't know why they didn't just go with MLs since that's the same thing, 
Um, seems like CCs, it'd be a lot e is a lot easier to miss here. Um, but for whatever reason, in medical medical profession, they say CCs, um, which is the exact same thing as milliliters. So, if we want our 532 milliliters in We want our 532 milliliters in liters. That's just one more step conversion, right? In fact, given what you have, I oh know I did make make it go to milliliters first. Ten to the three milliliters is one liter. Milli is one of our conversions, right? One of our prefixes that means a thousand. Somebody else asked a good question about millipedes. Why do they? How come if we call them millipedes, if they don't actually have a thousand legs? Um, my answer is, well, because they even without stopping to count all the legs individually, they could look at it and say it definitely has more legs than a centipede. So what's the next prefix? It's milli. Um, so I don't actually know. Nature tends not to do things in powers of 10. Um, probably if it's anything close to actually a thousand legs, it's probably 10 to the 20, or it's probably um, 1,024, because that's an even power of two. Um, but that's beside the point. I just thought that was a good question. That was kind of funny too. Um, I don't know about you. I'm not stopping to count millipedes legs. I don't like things with lots of legs. Um, I, I can leave the spiders in my house alone as long as they keep killing insects, but I draw the line at anything with more than eight legs. Um, that's just me though. All right. If we want this in terms of liters, we're just gonna divide by a thousand. So we'll get 0 0.532, right? Quick note about sig figs when it comes to decimals. How many sig figs are in this number? Two. Leading zeros, zeros to the left of the first digit, don't count as sig figs. So zeros that are trailing, that are at the end, count as a sig fig, because we only write them to show that, that uh, we measured that spot. And zeros that are between digits are sig figs. But leading zeros are not. The leading zeros are like the power are like the um, the power in scientific notation. They're only there to show where the decimal point goes, right? And so they're not considered a sig fig. So this is just two sig figs. All right. What if we want to find the volume of this box in terms of inches, I should say cubic inches? How can we go about doing that? There's there's two answers. So if you can think of one way to do that, what do you think? How do we get to cubic inches? Two point five four centimeters is one inch. We have to do that three times to cancel out all three powers of cubic centimeter of cubic centimeters, right? So this is the way we practiced it on Monday. Can anybody think of another way you could get your answer in cubic inches given the information that's on the board and on the slide? Does anything say that we have to find the volume in cubic centimeters first? We could take all three of these measurements and convert them to inches before we multiply them together to get the volume, right? Mathematically, that's that's would work. We took 7.68 centimeters, put that in inches. 12.45, put that in inches. 5.56, put that in inches. Is that going to give me a different answer mathematically than 500 and than doing it the way it's written on the board? Why not? This is converting each of these dimensions separately 
is doing this same exact conversion factor three times just before you multiply them together. So that's the other way of thinking about how these higher powers work. You have to convert all three of these to inches, all three dimensions, length, width, and height all have to be converted. If I only did this twice, what units am I gonna come up with? Inches squared times centimeters, which is not wrong. That is a volume unit. It's just not a really common one, right? You would, that would give us something. Two of the powers of centimeters would cancel out. The other one would still be there. Centimeters times inches squared. So if, it's, if a cubic centimeter is a box, it's one, one centimeter by one centimeter by one centimeter. This would be a box, that, box that's one inch by one inch by one centimeter. It works, it's, it is a volume. We don't really wanna deal with that though, right? There's another really weird unit of volume they use to measure lakes, the volume of lakes. Does anybody know anything about that? They don't use it on the lake as big as Tahoe, um, but acre feet. Acre is, a, is an area, right? So an acre foot is an acre one foot deep. That's another version of mixing up area units with other units, right? To get a volume. So typically they do that in with lakes where you know they're not 1600 feet deep um, because it's a decent measure both of how big the lake is on top and, and its depth that incorporates both of those aspects into it. In fact, if you go to Minnesota and talk about lakes, they don't even worry about the depth of the lake. They just say the lake is this many acres. They just talk about the surface area um, because Minnesota is flat. So they all pretty much have a depth that maxes out around 50 feet. There's, there's a, a lake called Malac, which is from the French word mill, like thousand, M-I-L-L-E, -L -L -E, which in French just means big. Um, and lac, L-A-C, lake. So it literally translates as big lake. And the Ojibwe word for it was basically the same thing in Ojibwe. Um, what's that? Tahoe means lake, exactly. Um, but uh, Lake, lake Malak is the same size on the area as Tahoe is. It's almost exactly 15 miles by 30 miles, just like Tahoe. Um, but its maximum depth is like 72 feet um, because it's really flat in Minnesota by our standards anyway. It's not all that bad when you compare it to like Kansas, but anyway, how would we get to erase that before we finish this, this problem? 532 cubic centimeters. We want cubic inches. We can do 2.54 cubic centimeters or sorry, centimeters is one inch. Cube the whole thing, what do we get in cubic inches? Something. That's a big difference, isn't it? That cubed aspect really messes with it because it's really about 10 times smaller rather than just two and a half times smaller because we have to do it three times. So what do we get if we wanted to go all the way to gallons? That's just one more step, right? 32.5 inches cubed. And there's that. 231 number, right? 231 inches cubed is one gallon. We don't need to cube this one or our units would get real wonky, right? We don't want to deal with inches to the ninth because I don't want to have to try and think about what that is. Yeah. Our puny human brains can't comprehend anything past a volume, right? So we don't want inches to the ninth, so we don't cube this whole thing. 
Does anybody know what the word Tesseract means besides being a MacGuffin in the Marvel Universe? It's, it's related to a cube. It's a related to a cube the same way that a cube is related to a square. It's a four, it's a four dimensional cube, um, which is weird, but basically it means if you took a slice of a tesseract in any direction, it's a cube. How do you take a slice of something and get a cube? That's how fourth dimension works. That's why we don't wanna deal with that. If you do wanna deal with that, go into, um, abstract math for your major. There's a whole field of study dedicated to things like this, um, non-Euclidean topologies and things like that. Um, but it hurts my head. And I like to think about that stuff. So, so we're going to get something here that's going to be about a tenth, right? About 0 0.1. 0 0.1406. Oh, How many sig figs do we get to keep? Oh, sorry, point. Just three sig figs, so 0. 0.141 gallons. All right, so how are we feeling about those? Be bit of a pain if I asked you to calculate it, a um, area in, or a volume in acre feet. But other than that, they're not that tricky, right? They're only really tricky if I make you do some, some weird funky unit you've never heard of. Other than that, check your conversion sheet. Make sure you got the right powers counseling each other out. One more quick note, just because if I go too fast, then we're going to have to get into talking about atoms and matter today. And I think it's a better better to end on a Friday talking about conversions. So does anybody know how to do a reasonableness check? It seemed like that was a big jump. 532 cubic centimeters equals, what did we say it was 32? No. 32.5 inches cubed equals 0 0.141 gallons. How do we know if that's reasonable or not? Does anybody have a good metric to imperial way to estimate? But you're all too young to have gone and ordered a pint of beer, but everybody knows what a pint glass looks like, right? Pint glass is almost exactly 500 cubic centimeters. One pint is really close. To, I think it's 473 milliliters is one pint. So if you know that a pint is really close to half a liter, that's a good way of estimating this. Half a liter, is that close to 0 0.141 gallons? How many, how many pints are in a gallon? There's four quarts in a gallon and there's two pints in a quart. So eight, what's an eighth of a gallon? What is one eighth as a decimal? Around that, good answer. Um, an eighth is half of 0.25, right? So 0.125. So pretty close to, that's pretty close to an eighth of a gallon. And that's pretty close to half a liter. You can come up with whatever sort of metric you want, whatever you have personal experience with in terms of being able to visually estimate sizes. A pint glass is just a really con um, really convenient one because it's pretty close to half a, a liter. And most people know about what a pint glass looks like even if you don't drink beer yet, right? So it's good to have some sort of those, those frames of reference for context so that you, we can know that we didn't mess up our calculation because that seemed like a big leap, right? But then when we look at it as in terms of physical objects, seems reasonable. You'll hear me say that all the time, reasonableness check. When you plug something into a calculator, you should already have a decent idea of what the answer is gonna be 
at least to within the power of 10. Right? If you plug something into your calculator and you think it should be about 500 and you get back um, 17,000, you may have just plugged it into your calculator wrong, right? But if you didn't stop to think about it, you might not have caught that. So have an idea of every time you hit enter on your calculator, I want you to practice sort of having a really rough idea of what it should be. Plus it'll help you with your mental arithmetic and being able to come up with answers on the fly. If you ever have to stand in front of a class and do math in your head, um, it's a pretty useful tool to know if I messed up or not when I'm trying to do things in my head. All right, last conversion topic for now. It's never the last one where there's always going to be more tools. We are always going to think about them in terms of conversions because we're going to get really good at conversions. If we have combined units, when I say combined units, I mean any anytime you've got a unit that's made up of other units. So like miles per hour is a combined unit. Grams per cubic centimeter is a combined unit. Breaths per minute is a combined unit. Right? Anytime you've got the word per involved in your unit, it's a combined unit. How do we do conversions with combined units? If we say 22.0 meters per second, and we want to know what that is in kilometers per hour. Because we can visualize what 22 meters per second is. That's what, 60 feet in a second. That's, that's moving pretty quick. But if we wanted to put that in terms of being able to compare it to how fast a car is moving, we might want it in kilometers per hour, right? How do we do that? We can change meters to kilometers. And we can change seconds to hours. So 22.0 meters and for every thousand meters is one kilometer, right? So we can divide by a thousand. So remember to keep three sig figs and that zero doesn't count. I'm gonna keep saying that. I know that most of you are with me on that, but there's probably still a few that have missed me saying that since it's only been twice. And that's a pretty common mistake with sig figs. So I'm gonna keep saying that. In fact, I'll say it again one more time. That's not a sig fig. Brute force repetition, when all else fails, if I say it enough times, eventually everyone will have heard me say it. Okay, well that gets, so how do we convert seconds to hours then though? What number do we start with? One, this was the distance it traveled in one second, right? So in other words, there's a one on the bottom there. So if we convert one second to hours, 60 seconds is one minute, 60 minutes is a terrible news show. I actually don't feel that strongly about it one way or the other, but I couldn't resist making a joke because I grew up with that on in my house every Sunday night. Um, anyway, you guys know what 60 minutes is? Okay. It used to be back before streaming, right? And on demand, you actually had to like tune in to watch shows at a specific time. And 60 minutes was the last show that was on on Sunday nights before my bedtime when I was, you know, six, seven, eight. Um, so my parents always wanted to watch 60 minutes. So it was always on. Like I said, I don't care that strongly about it, but I just have all these childhood memories. Oh, actually, I don't even remember who used to be on 60 minutes. I didn't care what their names were because I was six. Um, there's also a combined equation or a combined conversion factor on your conversion sheet, right? It just takes these and multiplies them together. 3,600 seconds is one hour. Um, so you can use that one if you want, or if you just remember these ones, do it twice, divide by 60 twice. What do we get for our number in terms of hours? One divided by 60, divided by 60 again. One over 3,600. Not technically correct, but also not useful. 
Somebody plug it in. There's more seven So that's going to be a repeating, oh, okay. repeating uh, infinitely. But we only get to keep, we're only going to keep three sig figs here. Anytime we have per one of something, we can assume that this one is exact because this is really the measured number. So we can keep as many sig figs as we want down here as long as we round it properly here. Perfect. So what's our speed in kilometers per hour? Well, 0 0.0220 kilometers per 2.778 times 10 to the minus four hours. Just do that division. We should wind up with something like, something close to 60, it's between 60 and 100. Practice. What it, what is it actually with the three sig figs? 79.2? To answer your question, how I was able to do that, I know miles per hour is about double meters per second. So miles per hour, it's going to be 40, 45 ish. And then I know kilometers is more than that, but not by that much. So, no, I can't do, I can't do this division in my head. Not that quickly in a way. Any swimmers here? Do you do long division when you're doing, when you're doing long sets? I used to do that in high school. If I had, you know, if it was, you're going to do 12 100s I'd, every lap. I would turn that into a fraction of how far done that was. And I'd start, and I'd see how many decimal points out I could go before I hit the wall and had to start over. Stuff like that helps too. Make yourself do mental arithmetic and it turns out you'll get better. <laughs> or maybe I was just a gigantic nerd in high school. It can be both. It can be both. Mm -hmm. Can't you do all of that in one of the first or I'm glad you brought that up. The other way we can do that, as long as we cancel out our units, we can leave it all together. You can say 22.0 kilometers over one second. We can do, or sorry, meters. We can do 10 to the three meters is one kilometer and our units canceled out just like before, right? <laughs> In fact, we'll color code this. If we have per second and second is on the bottom, we can still cancel that out and multiply by one just like normal, right? We're just gonna switch it so that instead of the unit canceling out being on bottom, we want the unit that we wanna cancel out to be on top. So we do 60 seconds is one minute and 60 minutes is one hour. If we do that, now we cancel out seconds, cancels out seconds, minutes, cancels out minutes, we're still gonna be left in kilometers per hour. And mathematically, that should give us the exact same answer. This is gonna result in us multiplying by 3,600 instead of dividing by 3,600 and then dividing by that, right? Mathematically, one over one over something is the original number back, right? So mathematically, it should give us the exact same thing, 79 point whatever, point two? Within sig figs. So whichever of those methods made sense to you, is totally fine. If you want to do it as two separate conversions and then do the division at the end, great. If it makes sense to, for you to do it all as one conversion, that's great too. 
I just want you to pick one way that makes sense and stick with it so that you're not going to, and you can work on it and try and do it both ways. So you get com comfortable with it in both, both methods. Um, but again, mathematically, as long as we're following our rules for sig figs, mathematically, we'll get the same answer or at least the same answer to the tenths place or however many sig figs we have. All right. Let's do let's do a fun one. I say fun. I'm using the term loosely. It is still just a conversion. Um, how how do you tell how far a thunderclap is away? A thunder. Yeah, have we done this conversion before? So how many? How do you tell? What's one second every mile. That's what I was taught as a child too. Let's see if that's accurate. Let's turn speed of sound from meters per second into miles per second. So 343 meters for one second. And we wanna put that in miles per second. And if that, if that approximation was a good approximation, we should get something close to one, right? That approximation is treating the speed of light like it's instant because it's so much faster than the speed of sound. That's a decent approximation. We can just say this, the light gets to you instantly. So how long does it take the sound to reach you? Well, how do we go from meters to miles? Meters to miles. Yeah, we can go meters to kilometers, kilometers to miles, or we can go meters to centimeters centimeters to feet, feet to miles, if we wanted to use all exact conversions. It's one step longer though, and we only have three sig figs here anyway. So 10 to the three meters is one kilometer. And 1.609 kilometers is one mile. What do we get? Not one, is it? 0. Point something close to two, isn't it? 0. Point 0.2 something, 0. 0.18. I think we're closer. Nah, farther. So if it's miles, if it's 0. 0.2 miles per second, flip that over to get seconds per mile, right? What's one over 0.2? It's five. So for every five seconds, it's a mile. Not for every one second. So if you counted and you got three, before you thought that was three miles away, right? It's easier to do that math, but really that's only 60% of a mile away, 0.6 miles away. I always think that's interesting because for whatever reason, maybe just because it's easier to do the math to count by ones and then instead of then having to divide by five at the end. But yeah, it's for take however many seconds and divide by five. That's how many miles away the lightning strike is. All right, let me make sure that there's nothing else that I wanted to get to today. We can end with one more since we have six minutes left. It's a little bit early to just start packing up. This one won't take us six minutes though. If you're traveling 65 miles an hour, let's make this more interesting. Um, how many feet can you travel in 45 seconds? If you're going 65 miles an hour. That's just kind of an interesting one to think about when you're in the car on the highway, how many feet are you moving in 45 seconds? He can answer that, surprise, surprise, with a conversion. Okay. 45 seconds, we wanna turn that into feet. 
anytime you're trying to go from one type of unit to another type of unit, like a time to a distance, you're going to have to use one of these combined units somehow. So we're going to use that 65 miles per hour as a conversion. So we can go 45 seconds to hours to miles to feet. That step's easy, right? That step's easy. For that step, you just have to use that 65 miles equals one hour. And that's gonna allow us to go from time units to distance units. So just to get a number, 45 seconds, 3,600 seconds, one hour. One hour, 65 miles. One mile is 5,280 feet. So it works. You can estimate this one in your head too, if you know 60 miles an hour is a mile a minute. And this is three quarters of that. So we should get a number that's around three quarters of a mile in terms of feet. So something in the, something around 3,800 feet, probably. Now it might be closer to a mile, might be closer to 5,000 feet. Forgot about the 65 um, miles. 4,290. 4, feet in 45 seconds. Or you could even turn it into feet per second if you wanted to, just so that you can count off and you can count how many feet you're going as you're driving down the freeway. The driving equivalent of, uh, of trying to do long division in your head when you're doing laps. All right, let's go ahead and back up. We'll start talking about the nature of matter and how science works on Monday.